teacher aid is an aid for a teacher. It's not the aid for the child, it's the aid for the teacher to teach the child, because the teacher is still the teacher of the child. So that's one of the most important things I think to remember, is that you are aiding the teacher, and working with the teacher, and so aiding the child incidentally. Oh, we back the teacher and try and get the child to catch up with the rest of the class, so we really back the teacher and just help the child one on one usually, well I do, one on one and keep them up to date with their reading and spelling and try and catch them up with their class. A teacher aide is um, personnel that comes into our school and works alongside teachers and alongside children. Now the role of a teacher aide has actually changed significantly over the last few years. Officially they're known as paraprofessionals now, support staff in the school. Uh, once upon a time they were pretty much limited to things like mixing the paint and chopping the paper, but um, these days um, they can have a huge range of tasks. So it might be working with a writing group, it might be with a reading group, reading to children, um, it could actually be during a math session, um, or it could just be the teacher aid is support in the classroom as another adult that the children can go to and call upon. They come in a variety of flavours, um, it depends on the role they've got. Um, some people you pick up uh, because they have a specific skill set, others come in because you've been given some funding in a hurry for a kid who needs assistance in a hurry and there happens to be somebody around that a member of staff might know and so you say to that person, would you come and give us a hand for two or three weeks? Which is how we've got a lot of, picked up a lot of ours actually. Principal and teachers will decide the best way to use a teacher's aid, the most effective way. Uh, they have to work out who will be responsible for her professional development, who will build into her work, her program, who will give her feedback who will evaluate her work, who will do her appraisal, all those things have to be considered. Some schools may employ a teacher aid uh, on a permanent basis, they may choose to use their funding for that purpose and other, uh, other schools will employ teacher aids um, depending on the needs of the children they have at any one particular time. It's a choice how they spend um, you know, their particular budget, but funding does often follow children depending on the needs of the child. Sometimes it may be just doing a little bit of reading, uh, reading recovery uh, type stuff. Maybe it's doing some maths, just checking that they are on target. If they find difficulties that they know where to go to ask. But it's not being constantly with the child, so the child thinks they own you. That's one of the pitfalls of teacher aids. It's aiding the teacher again. So you are moving amongst the children so they know that you are helping others too but you're keeping your eye on the child. In some instances where a child needs a great deal of help, you will stay with the child, but we try to intersperse it as much as possible. They can cover a huge amount of, um, of needs and quite often developing resources for a particular child as well. So, um, you know, if you have a teacher aide that's really talented in that area, they're very valuable to the school. The teacher is actually setting the program for the teacher aide and directing the teacher aid and meeting regularly with the teacher aid. And so um, the teacher aid is really following what it is the teacher wants them doing within the classroom. So it's not a teaching role, it's actually supporting the teacher in the classroom. They're not expected to make the call about how best to um, take the next step, but they're given quite clear tasks to do, which do have a learning component, but they're not having to make those decisions about where to go next, that's the teacher's job. So They always work strictly under a teacher and they will, will, will work from uh, plans and um, educational plans developed alongside the teacher and the family or whanau as well. Yeah, it's important there is a relationship, you can't just dictate to the teacher aid, you know, this is what you do, you need to let the teacher aid have some influence too because they, they, as they develop a relationship with the child they learn how the child learns and so they come back to you with good ideas and you've got to listen to their ideas because you know you need to use their innovation and, and stuff too so it's a very much a go-between relationship with the child in the middle is the most important 
person. Oh, very, very, very important. To, if you didn't partner with the teachers, you'd get lost, actually, really, because you'd just flounder off by yourself. You have no idea what you're doing. Especially to make sure that you're leading the child in the right area and you're teaching the correct things, because there's no point in you teaching the child one thing, they go back to class and taught it completely different. Like, same with going back to like the numeracy, the children that I take out, they have their teacher time with the class, with the teacher, but then they come out and just do the support with me. So the t teachers are teaching them the strategies and I'm just teaching them just the way to work it out. The role between the um, teacher and teacher aide here is just fantastic. Oh, you know, there's, they're just there, as I said before, to support us and uh, uh, to run alongside really what's happening in the classroom. Um, they include us in uh, a variety of you know, different activities that they're doing and giving you um, support one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, you know, they come alongside you and go, well, you know, we need to be doing this and this and this and this with this child. So you're not sort of kind of left to flounder yourself. You've got some steps to follow. Um, got a bit of a plan to actually act upon. So a lot of the stuff, um, even though there is, you know, some of my input obviously as well as, a lot of it is down to being in a, a plan and, uh, yeah, so it's, you don't feel like you kind of left on a limb. Some people do tend to think it's just working with children with special needs but that's not always the case. The school can use them for lots of one-on-one -on -one and uh, children that do need a little extra and I guess at the other end of the spectrum they could also be used for um, extension work where there's children who are maybe gifted or um, excelling. A teacher aide would be useful also um, you know, to extend their learning. I think the traits for a teacher aide is you have to be uh, willing to adapt a caring person, someone who actually loves the job, because really you got to be able to just get in there and do whatever needs to be done. And I think really you have to want to see the best for the child that you're working with and the children around them as well. It boils down to two, two or three things really. Um, the patience of Job, the wisdom of Solomon and the willing to, willingness to work for peanuts. <laughs> because um, their, to be honest their salary, is their wage rate is fractionally above minimum wage. Um, there is a scale that they work through um, depending on they can get a climb up the wage scale according to uh, the complexity and the level of responsibility that they undertake, complexity of the role, but for most of them they start at the bottom as you do in any trade I guess, work their way up, um, but in the main forget the money because nobody goes into teacher rating for money. Well I think the first and most important thing is you've got to like kids. Um, you know, if you, didn't, if you didn't have a sort of a kind of, you know, a bent for children then this wouldn't be the deal. And, and that's one of the things that I, I like about children, I like their spontaneity and just their, they kind of say it as it is, you know, you, you get, they call, they, it's, they're black and white, there's no sort of kind of grey areas here. If you are a mum, I think you tick the first box because you know and understand how kids tick, what um, causes them this stresses and sadnesses and uh, sometimes you will react with the mother heart and that is, uh, it's a huge plus. You certainly need buckets of patience. They also must have a passion for education and um, a real interest and desire to help children with learning needs. It's a great place to start, quite often teacher aides go on to further teacher training. Uh, it's a great family orientated job because the hours suit um, often mums with children of their own. And the other great thing is you're often working with children in your own community. Quite often it's the local school that you're working at, so you are making those really strong community links as well. You get kind of everything with them, warts and all. And, and I guess I kind of like that. You, you can be yourself. You don't have to be, you know, somebody different because um, they're really good at picking a fake. Quite often you'll find teacher aides have um, children with um, learning needs or learning difficulties in their own family and they've developed a little bit of interest from that area um, and sometimes it's just something that they really enjoy doing. They are a really special type of person, teacher aide, and of course they have to be to work in the situations that they do and um, in the circumstances that they do because as you can imagine, you know, there's the um, the other side of teacher aiding too, that's a lot of people don't really think about like hygiene, um, toileting, um, you know, areas like that you get children with high needs um, that are maybe wheelchair bound and um, or maybe um, have different degrees of uh, paralysis. The teachers aides that I've ex had experience with over the years have come from a massive variety of backgrounds and it's often the person with life experience, often they'll have 
um, the experienced parents. So there's lots of other attributes, you know, they're not only teacher aides, they're nurses, they're friends, they're caregivers, they're everything to the child. So that it really does take a special kind of person that wants to be a teacher aide and they certainly do have to have a passion for working with, with children and assisting them. children come into school and they're ready to go and other children come into school and they haven't had the same sort of experiences so if a child hasn't got the oral language that they need it then affects writing and reading and so support is needed with these children in oral language before anything else in those first years at school. There's a document the Ministry put out called Literacy Learning Progressions and they did a draft copy which outlined all the features of a five-year-old who was ready and prepared to start school. I have actually designed a programme to catch the children who start school at five, who are highly at risk, who are not going to be able to read. These children haven't a hope of reaching red level after being at school six months and that's where national standards would like to see them reading at. You usually find that the children that are having difficulty with um, reading or oral language or often are children that have got a thing about pens and paper. And if you can get um, toys or little trucks and um, build roads and do position words, things like that while they're working with hands-on rather than pen and paper, which teacher aides can do because they've got a fraction more time usually, it's invaluable. When a child is recommended, their needs are specified and looked at with the teacher aid. And so it's pinpointed what it is that needs to be worked on in order to move that child forward. If the teacher aid is working on pinpointing these needs and focusing on developing these areas, then often it can just be a short burst. Um, so it, it's really dependent on the child as to um, you know, how long the teacher aide is working alongside them and also I guess to um, you know, looking at the severity of the needs of that particular child as well. The areas for helping children with, nu with numeracy, um, a lot of it is just like basics, just counting up and back. I, the children I work with are right near the bottom, so it's just some of them are just counting up and back in 20s, or up to 20, just counting one. And a good technique is a clapping technique, is you clap with the child and clap up and down, and it actually gets a good rhythm going with them as well. And just playing lots of games. Like one of the, my children's favourite game is bingo, but I have four different types of bingo games. And like there's one which is, um, in teens and teens, because teens and teens is a big one which a lot of children have problems getting confused with 19 and 90. So the game is just set up with that and then we play in just a normal bingo game. Most children with a one-on-one -on -one teacher aid situation will have an individualised education plan, well they certainly should have, mapped out for them. Um, and that will basically focus on around about a term's worth of targets and goals. The team that puts that together does involve the teacher, the TA, any specialists that are involved and the parents. For me and um, for the student it really is about choice. Um, it's about at the end of the day if I'm not there supporting the student then are they going to make those right choices. First I'm giving them the two choices, A or B, but ultimately the A or B is going to end up down the right path. Uh, we try and eliminate all those other options that could lead the wrong way. Uh, I, I think it is really good to offer children choices because it gives them um, it gives them some sort of feeling of satisfaction and some sort of feeling of um, credibility in themselves and um, self belief. So asking them option A or option B, it's certainly giving them the responsibility to make their own choices and to be responsible for their own decisions. It's been a lot of times that um, there's a little bit of movement in A and B. Um, but since the start of the year, that has now come to most of the time we can choose A or B. Yeah, so it's about encouraging and it's also about making sure that they're getting 
the work done, they're safe and it's keeping other kids safe as well. It is a really useful strategy, once again, depending on the child and, um, and the outcome you're looking for, but it does certainly lead to them taking responsibility for their own decision making and their own learning. We get a result of what we're wanting, so seen a huge difference in the child since the start of the year, which is rewarding, it's why we do the job. With our high needs child, uh, his, his whole teaching program is completely different to what you do with a, with a normal child anyway, because he has very high needs. He is fully reliant on you practically for everything. He makes noises and certain gestures to, you know, to say what he wants or if he likes, but he does his own computer program, which he does with a computer and he has a little button to where he can actually independently now use a switch to control a computer program, which we make our own computer programs for him, which is a books and pictures and things, things that uh, have, um, things for him that he enjoys and are associated around him and now he can actually go through with a prompt which he can hear from the screen and we can sit back and he can actually move the control the switch. And that if you sit back from him he'll be happily to do his, you know, switching for a good 20 minutes by himself which is an improvement from when I started. Um, he probably would only press the switch two to five times in that whole 20 minutes and we would have to help him, I would have to help him. Up until now, that's been the only independent thing that he can do. So when it comes to numeracy and literacy and all those other areas, it doesn't really incorporate with, his, with that child's program. So that's an, an individualised thing. I take what's called PMP program, which is Perceptual Motor Program, and that looks at uh, helping uh, the junior school go through just a number of uh, different exercises. Officially, there's not a lot of research, empirical, data to support the impact of PMP, but the reality is for us, uh, we see that it works. And uh, the kids don't really think it's perhaps learning based, but um, there's a lot of learning that goes on. But it's actually a lot about developing language and improving coordination. The kids often come to school with no idea of where to put a preposition, so the kids learn things like it's under that or on that or beside that or behind that, all the while playing games using all that sort of stuff. Different type of activities that um, we work with the children, whether it be um, walking along a balance beam or uh, getting them to picking up and throwing a ball can be a lot of memory work with, I would say, a sequence of different objects that are on the floor and they have to jump on them in the same order that I say them in. Bowling balls, uh, there is climbing up ladders and a whole lot of different, different movement activities. Many of today's kids aren't as active as previous generations and a lot of that's got to do with the screen generation, the digital natives if you will. Um, so in terms of activity early in the day, we put it early in the day for that reason. It does give the kids some activity that gives them a real buzz. They have found that by doing some of these activities it helps them in the classroom as well. So there's a, a real link between exercise and uh, getting started to reading and writing. And for an element of, uh, of any school's population, some of those kids of all ages, not just five-year-olds, come to school from out of a stressful environment uh, for one reason or another. So if they can have a physical activity that gets, if they have fun, get a bit of dopamine and serotonin going through the system, they're in a much better learning space in their head than they would have been without it. I often get to, to work with boys and just often talk with them, um, especially about their, some of their writing before they actually write. And so, uh, you know, we get a lot of uh, that uh, excess energy uh, out of the road by uh, chatting and I am very privileged to be able to teach um, values here at school and as it is part of the curriculum uh, for all schools uh, we go through four of our core values and I get to do one of those core values once a term. That means that I go into every classroom right throughout the school, I'll um, get a chance to see them every second week and uh, that's a great time. We spend about 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how long I want to chat for, and uh, go through um, yeah, the values. Now, values here are responsibility, respect, um, personal excellence, and integrity. The end result aim is good citizens. Um, it doesn't come with any um, religious bias at all, because um, that's we're a secular institution. Some of those are pretty big words to be able to kind of hang some hooks on for kids and so that's a bit of a challenge for me and uh, this year I'm looking to uh, also um, 
it's part of my appraisal um, at the school here, so I'm looking to see how I can better communicate uh, across the board in regards to uh, value, so yeah. Um, goals and plans are set depending once again on the needs of the child but in very small steps so there's no point in having goals that are unachievable so the, the, the teacher works really closely with the family once again and the teacher aid and they work out um, goals or milestones along the way and um, obviously are celebrated when they're reached with the child as well. Four behaviours with the student that I work with at the moment. Uh, we do a centre of things, so often it's about the choices. If I'm giving choice A or cho choice B, often one will be more of a reward than the other, it will be a bit more exciting than the other to encourage him to make that right choice. Rewards, thing. I mean I have used the, um, the lolly deal. Not that I like that um, specifically, I don't use reward charts, I, I, I more tend to head towards that, the whole idea of the time thing. I like playing sports, so I, I encourage, especially because I, I work I generally with boys, um, they uh, respond well to that type of reward system, so you know we either go out, kick a ball as I say, or um, maybe hit a ball with racket and ball, or just do a variety of different things. I, um, I buy the gold coins, you know, the chocolate coins and I have them on my desk so the kids' eyes light up when they come in and every Friday's payday and they come in, is it payday today and this is my week again? Yeah, we do that on a Friday. So the children that have done their homework all week and work well and not been silly and uh, they have payday on Friday. And then we reward with stickers as well, you know, with the young ones especially, that works. Well, I have two special drawers, one drawer is for the stickers and I make special charts up for the children, another one is full of stamps. And my favourite stamps, which the children love, um, I have a large collection of SpongeBob stamps, which the kids love, the SpongeBob stamps. And I also have those very cool ones where it's like a kiwi on one side, and on the other side is its footprints, and you roll the wee roller across and it leaves a trail of its footprints. There's a whole collection of those that you can buy, and the children love those, they're <laughs> very cool. And I also, children who work with me, I always give them a the treat at the end of the term, they always get a wee treat from me. I know that he loves the computer, so if it's something like that, then we try and incorporate it into whatever we've asked him to do, or he might be able to do something as a bonus later on. So it's just, it's identifying what the child enjoys or where they excel at and give them that little bit of oomph, I'd say, something extra where it makes him feel special and go, oh well, I'll put that little bit of effort in. Um, there are certainly clear learning goals set and um, definitely um, goals that work towards and can be achievable. So it's really important for the teacher aide to have a good idea of the family once again and their hopes and dreams and aspirations for their child and, um, and how they uh, view the importance of, of the goals. And I think it's really important for the child too to have goals and um, things to work towards and then maybe, you know, however that's managed when they get there, whether it's, a, it's some sort of um, celebration reward system or on to the next one um, as you know they're just no different than anyone else they like to achieve and when they get there it's um, you know it's a cause for celebration. When I was here my first year I had I used to take the sports with some of the boys during interval and lunch time um, and that's kind of changed over the, the, the years I've been but that was fun so you know they, they'd, they'd see me not just in the role of being a teacher but they'd also see me on the playground we, I work with one wee boy where he just loves to kick a ball. And so, you know, I say to him now, look, if we get all of our work done and, uh, you know, and you, you've got it all sustenance, sweet as, then we can go outside and we can kick a ball. And he's really happy to be able to see that apple dangled at the end of his, um, his time with me. Mm -hmm. Behavioural needs is really challenging. So teacher aides need to have really strong guidelines, really strong support systems and um, be able to work at really closely with the school and with other specialists in the school. There's usually um, OTs or um, behavioural um, specialists in schools where there are a lot of children with high needs. So they would be working very closely with those professionals as well and um, getting lots of guidance and assistance and putting 
plans in place and once again linking with the family and um, carrying out those plans at home too. So it certainly does become um, a team effort to reach you know, the goals or the best outcome for the child. You know, some kids when they arrive at school here, you know, if they've had a bit of a, a horrible sort of start to the day or, you know, they haven't had enough sleep or they might not have had enough food. Um, and so, you know, they come along a bit grumpy and grouchy and so you've got to kind of be able to go with the swings and roundabouts. I mean, if they're not performing at their best because of some of those things, and you know that that's the case in some instances, uh, then you've got to go a little bit softer and go, well, you know, hey, look, you know, let's take it a little bit easier today. So you've just got to kind of roll with the punches, as it were, um, on some of those sort of days. And, you know, we all have those. I mean, you and I like it as well, eh? And kids are no different. Yes, behavioural issues is a really awkward one and um, it links really closely to a lot of uh, children with high needs as well and the behaviours often is the product of not only their, their, um, their illness but their environment as well and um, behavioural issues, often the older the child gets the more intense often the behavioural issues become and obviously physically in stature children become larger and more difficult to physically um, handle as well. So once again, you know, there's so many different disabilities with that where behaviour, behavioural issues materialise in so many different ways and, you know, even working with children with Down syndrome, um, their behavioural needs or the way you would approach um, dealing with behavioural issues from a child with that would differ dealing with a child with other um, behavioural issues depending on what they are. So, but um, definitely clear working uh, relationship with the family and the teacher and the rest of the school is imperative.